Gupta. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the first session of 2017. I'd like to <clears throat> wish you all a very happy new year. And um, 2016 was an excellent year for us, and 2017 promises to be even better. We have some very good lectures lined up by our own faculty as well as uh, a number of distinguished international speakers. So please stay tuned, follow us on um, Facebook and Twitter, and uh, continue to attend the sessions. And please let your friends know about the uh, teaching program that we have here because we, um, we are not for profit. We are doing this because we enjoy doing it, and we want you to enjoy it as well. So uh, please do share the information about our lectures. Uh, today, I thought we'd start the year by doing an emergency radiology quiz. And the theme of the quiz is what differentiates a good emergency radiologist from a great emergency radiologist. So uh, there are certain patterns in emergency radiology which I think uh, the more you practice it, the more you start to recognize. Uh, there are certain types of cases, there are certain uh, pathologies, certain uh, certain syndromes that you begin to recognize. So here, for example, the first case that I'm showing, uh, it's, an, it's one of those very obvious things. So uh, you can please feel free to put the answer in the chat box. Anyone who uh, has the diagnosis, please type in the answer into the chat box. And please say uh, to everyone, uh, send it to everyone so everybody gets to see your response. So I'm looking forward to uh, hearing responses from all of you. But uh, let's start with this first case, which is fairly straightforward. And we can all see that there is a, a large abdominal aortic aneurysm. And next to the aneurysm, there is a large soft tissue hematoma. And the aneurysm has a disruption in its contour right here. And there's also a hyperdense crescent within the aneurysm. So this is a ruptured or leaking abdominal aortic aneurysm with a retroperitoneal hematoma, a large retroperitoneal hematoma. Um, the importance of the hyperdense crescent lies in the fact that if, if this hematoma were unruptured, then just seeing the hyperdense crescent by itself is a poor prognostic sign as it can indicate impending rupture. So if we see a large abdominal aortic aneurysm with a, uh, a hyperdense crescent such as this, this means that there is acute intramural hematoma and the patient is at risk for impending rupture and therefore needs to be monitored very closely. So uh, so the, the point is here and the reason for my uh, you know, mentioning the theme of this class is that, you know, the, the most radiologists will pick up the uh, large abdominal aortic aneurysm and certainly the large retroperitoneal hematoma and recognize the fact that this is ruptured. So the next stage is to be able to detect the fact that there is a hyperdense crescent in the wall. And so in a patient with an unruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm, one can guide the clinician that this patient is at significant risk of impending rupture and has to be managed uh, very cautiously. We move on to the next case. So that was a straightforward, uh, in quotes, easy case where the finding is very obvious and the diagnosis is also very obvious. But you, in emergency radiology, you also occasionally encounter cases which are not that uh, straightforward and not that obvious, and this is one of them. This is a young patient with abdominal pain. So would anyone care to give a diagnosis? There are three findings on this scan which help us to make the diagnosis. One of them is very obvious, one of them is subtle, and one of them is extremely subtle. But as in most cases in radiology, we are doing the job of Sherlock Holmes, we're putting together, we're making a deduction after making observations. So our first job is to make the observations. And uh, if anyone has seen an obvious finding on the CT, please uh, feel free to enter on the chat box. Is there, uh, Kavita, does uh, everyone know how to do the chat box entries? And you just have to reply to that. Uh, and when you reply to that, your answer will also be seen by everyone. So in this case, we have a uh, uh, one obvious finding, which is if you look at the spleen here, that's actually the spleen. It's not a part of the stomach. And it's extremely dense. Size and it's irregular in contour. So these are, these are all features of what we call an autosplenectomy. And uh, the moment we hear that term, then of course we 
uh, pretty much know what the diagnosis is. So now that we know what the diagnosis is, and the diagnosis is, anybody would care to give the diagnosis in the box, that would be excellent. Uh, once we've made that diagnosis, then we look for additional findings, and one of them is right here. You see a small soft tissue density in the uh, mediastinum, and that is a, uh, that is an example of extra medullary hematopoiesis in this patient with sickle cell anemia. The uh, third finding, which is actually very hard to make on this scan because the uh, it's, sent, it's done in a soft tissue window, is the density of the bones. This is uh, sclerotic vertebra. The ribs are also sclerotic, so these bony changes are classical for sickle cell anemia. Um, in emergency radiology, a significant portion of what we do is trauma imaging, and in trauma also there are patterns. So just as there are patterns, you just saw the, the pattern of a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm, we saw the pattern of a sickle cell uh, patient, and this is a trauma pattern, and uh, once you start seeing these more and more of these cases, you get used to identifying these patterns. So patient with chest trauma, this is a condition that we don't see very often nowadays because of uh, the use of seat belts and airbags. But it used to be not uncommon with high-speed trauma in the old days. And um, the important learning from this uh, case is is a famous is based on a famous saying, which is what the what the mind does not know, the eye will not see. So when you know what to expect, then you look for it. And in a patient with high-velocity chest trauma, the first thing you want to exclude is aortic injury, and the most common location for aortic injury is the aortic isthmus, so that is where your eye should go first, and lo and behold, there is in fact a small sacular pseudoaneurysm or um, traumatic pseudoaneurysm of the aorta at the aortic isthmus, and it's in fact leaking. There's also some uh, mediastinal hematoma associated with it. So uh, in, in patients with trauma, when you're doing your trauma check, you see these patients have lots and lots of images because they've had chest, abdomen, pelvis, CT, so there are thousands of uh, images to look at. But please always remember to look very carefully at the aortic isthmus, which is uh, just below the carina at the level of the pulmonary artery bifurcation. And that is where you expect to see aortic disruption or traumatic uh, aortic laceration or a traumatic aortic pseudoaneurysm. Then there are the kind of cases which are where the findings are extremely subtle, and one has to really hunt for them. Uh, and in having a history that that points you in that direction is extremely helpful. Sometimes you get very limited history, but in this case, the history said severe postprandial pain. So uh, when you have such a specific history as that, one of the things that one should look for and uh, is present in this case is this condition where you see the uh, celiac artery is kinked and there is a impression on it and this is the result of indentation by the median arcuate ligament of the diaphragm uh, which comes down and kinks the celiac artery and uh, it causes a form of uh, postprandial uh, relative ischemia of the gut because of the, uh, the when this, this portion of the vessel cannot uh, dilate in response to the um, uh, the process of eating, and therefore this can cause symptoms. So, median arcuate ligament syndrome is something that we can uh, diagnose on CT using a combination of axial images and sagittal deformats. This kind of kink that we see here is very classical. So, that's something to look out for. Uh, the other thing in emergency radiology that's important is to be able to put together, as I said, patterns and when we are making the diagnosis to look for complications. So in this case, patient has come with acute chest pain. Can anyone uh, see what the diagnosis is here? So the finding is, again, once again in the uh, aorta. We have uh, a dilated aorta with an internal flap. Uh, this is the ascending aorta. So this is, and you can see it better on these V formats. So this is, in fact, an uh, ascending aortic dissection or a type Sanford type A dissection. Now, we could stop there and say, you know, this is what we've diagnosed and the clinician has enough information to proceed. 
Okay, good. Now I'm starting to see some responses. Very good. good. Thank you. Please don't send private responses because uh, then nobody can see them. Please send them to the group. So I had two responses there from Dr. Tran and Dr. Sanjeev. Uh, both said aortic dissection, which is absolutely correct. Uh, having said that there is an aortic dissection, there are a couple of other things that we need to look for in these patients. And those are present on this patient. Does it, do you see anything else? Look at the image on the top right. There is an additional finding apart from the aortic dissection. Can you tell me what that is? So when you're looking at the heart, always remember to make sure that what you're looking at is you look at the myocardium and you look at the pericardium. And in this case, the pericardium is actually, the space, pericardial space is distended. So there is a pericardial effusion here. It's a hyperdense pericardial effusion. And if you see a hyperdense pericardial effusion in a patient with an aortic dissection, it's extremely worrisome for a leak of the dissection into the pericardial space and hemopericardium. And if we go one step further and we look down now into the uh, abdomen, we start to see things like reflux of the venous contrast into the IVC and its branches, and that tells us that this patient is actually going into tamponade, and it's also shown by the fact that the right uh, ventricular size is quite small in this patient. So, uh, so the more we look at these scans, the more things we can uh, tell the clinicians. There's also uh, uh, some degree of, you know, the, the aortic valve is also dilated, so there's probably some degree of aortic insufficiency as well. And the fact that the dissection extends to the aortic valve is something that needs to be communicated to the uh, clinician. This is the, you can see that it's extending below the sinuses of Valsalva. So that's uh, another example of pattern detection in, in emergency radiology. We go beyond the diagnosis to also looking for complications and sequelae of complications. So in the case of the aortic dissection, we look for pericardial effusion, hemopericardium, and we look for the secondary signs of cardiac tamponade. Uh, one more such example, and this is an, uh, again a fairly obvious diagnosis, uh, perhaps not windowed very well, but uh, I hope you can all see the finding. Anybody care to give a response? Excellent. Acute pulmonary embolism. Chetna has given the correct answer. And we have bilateral filling defects in the pulmonary arteries. Uh, we can also see one that is extending across the pulmonary artery bifurcation. So this is a, a patient with a saddle embolus. This extends, indicates a very large volume of clot. And over and above that, we see one other finding on this section, which is that the right heart is dilated. So this is a patient with an acute right ventricular strain or failure pattern, which is important. This is a very poor prognostic sign if we see it. So it's important to highlight it to the clinician in a patient with PV. So uh, when you're looking, when you see PV, look also for uh, uh, something like this, which is a saddle embolus. Look for dilatation of the right heart, which indicates uh, onset of right heart failure and is a poor prognostic sign. And of course, in this case, we haven't shown you the lung windows, but look for pulmonary features, the secondary features of pulmonary embolism, which include pulmonary infarct in the form of wedge shaped pulmonary capacities. Um, so, those are, I think, I will um, move on to one last example before I conclude. This is just a short introductory class for the year. Uh, we actually had a scheduled lecture, but uh, that uh, didn't happen, so I'm stepping in. Uh, just to show you, in the setting of emergency radiology, we see very interesting things, and we see them more commonly than others do. So this is an entity which most people would not see very often in the course of, you know, several months or a year. We see this, these, actually, both these cases were uh, came to me today in the course of a single day. So these are both cases from today, uh, which were on my teleradiology work list. And both, uh, these are different patients, but they both have the same diagnosis. So I thought I'd share them with you. And uh, if anyone can tell me what the diagnosis is. We have uh, one response which said Boctilec. It's not quite a Boctilec, it's more than that. And the second response from Dr. Chetna is correct. This is in fact a or uh, well, these are both, in fact, gastric volvulus. Uh, this is, as you can see, this is uh, the, both patients have large hiatal hernias of the paraesophageal kind, what used to be called the rolling as opposed to the sliding hiatal hernia. And these patients are particularly predisposed to this type of gastric volvulus. 
Uh, what type of gastric volvulus is this? There are two types, as we know, and this is the um, these are the two types: the organoaxial, which occurs along the long axis of the uh, stomach, and the mesenteroaxial, which occurs across the short axis. The organoaxial version uh, variant is the one that occurs more commonly in older people and tends to be uh, associated with hiatal hernias. The mesenteroaxial volvulus tends to occur in children uh, and uh, uh, is therefore a different different type of demographic altogether. So as you can see, these are both older patients. So this is, these are in fact organoaxial volvulus, which is seen in association with uh, hiatal hernia and of course there is gastric outlet obstruction in these cases. So, uh, so emergency radiology is interesting. I find it fascinating. Uh, it offers incredible variety. It's a very uh, stimulating and uh, challenging branch of radiology because you need to have uh, you know your uh, eyes open at all times and you're using mod all kinds of different modalities in the course of, the, of a single work day. So uh, it's extremely satisfying to practice and uh, you see a lot of interesting and exciting pathologies. So uh, we look forward to sharing more of such cases with you over the course of the year. And uh, thank you all for joining us. And once again, I'd like to wish all of you a very, very happy and successful 2017 and look forward to many more excellent classes. Thank you for participating and responding and wish you all the best.